Looks like we're at seven o'clock and I believe everybody is here. So I think we should call the meeting to order and note attendance. Noted. Thank you. If we could bring up the flag, we'll begin with the flag salute and then move into our agenda review. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag. of the United States, United States, United States and to the Republic for which it stands, which stands one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with indivisible justice. Thank you. All right. Taking a quick look at the agenda, everybody, uh, I would accept a motion to approve the agenda as published. I move to uh, approve the agenda as published. So moved. Second it. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, Debbie, please. Jonathan. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Janet. Yes. Tom. Aye. Lori. Yes. Kelly. Yes. Irv. Yes. Thank you. All in favor. Thanks, everybody. So we do have a consent agenda item tonight, which includes the minutes from March 8th and the 22nd, as well as the uh, approval of employment for a couple of employees. Um, I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. So moved. I'll second. second it. Moved and seconded. <laughs> we'll, we'll say Jennifer did. I saw her hand slightly first. <laughs> okay, uh, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, Debbie. Jonathan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Janet? Yes. Tom? Hi. Lori? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Er. Yes. Thank you. All in favor. All right. Next up, we have our student reps. Hmm. Does it going to be Tyson and Madison? Tyson is here, but I don't see Madison. Hi, Tyson. All if she doesn't, if she's not here. Is she not here? Go for it. I got All right. Email, but I don't see her. Okay. I will just go through the entire thing. Sweet. All right, guys. Hello. I am Tyson Erickson, the ASB president at Silverton High School. And to start off, our theater department is currently planning another virtual show. They are holding auditions next week and plan on having it available to everyone before graduation. And our band is currently excited to announce that there are five students who will be moving on to the state competition in May. After winning first place in the district for solo and ensemble contest, Annalise Carpenter, Carter Dowd, Avery Horner, Miguel Sanchez, Anna Muel, and Teresa Daggett will all be competing on behalf of Silverton in May. The car club is currently still up and running. They'll be holding their next meeting April 15th at 4 p.m. in the auto shop. National Honor Society is staying busy by hosting a successful virtual reading under the stars for elementary students. They are also organizing a book and school supply drive to assist in providing elementary schools with supplies and books. Silverton FFA recently competed in the district officer elections in which two positions are held by chapter members. They will also be beginning to prepare for state, which in early May, as well as planning their chapter officer elections and awards banquet. The SHS Mental Health Club is planning a virtual scavenger hunt for students to help encourage students to connect and have fun. The Trap Shooting Club has been practicing on Wednesday nights they had their first competition this week on Wednesday. Our softball team is currently very excited to get the season going after a long wait. They are very excited to be back and able to compete. On that note, string sports have begun. Baseball, softball, tennis, track and field, and golf will be in full swing this week. 
And for our fall sports are all wrapped up with their season this past week with their final match games and meets of the season. Our girls varsity soccer team finished with three wins, two losses, three ties. Our boys varsity soccer team finished five and three. Our varsity football team finished three and one. And our varsity volleyball team finished eight and five. Our cross country team competed in their district meet in Lebanon on Saturday. The girls varsity team took second place with the best score they have had since 1996. In a normal year, they will be off to state next. The boys varsity cross country team went into district meet ranked fifth and came out with third place win overall. Abigail Espionaro won an individual medal coming in seventh place, place for the girls. ASB kicked off their 2021 virtual Best Fox Ever show this week to raise money for medical teams, Air National, and SACA, Silverton Area Community Aid. Six seniors will be competing for the coveted title of the 2021 Best Fox Ever. Contestants will submit fun videos each week as well as raise money for great causes. And that'll wrap up all the updates for Silverton High School. Thank you for your time and go Foxes. Thanks, Tyson. Really appreciate it. Thank yeah, of course. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You bet. Thank you for coming. Love the energy. All right, well, that's tough to follow here, but uh, next up we have our school principal report with Silver Deny. Unmute and start video. Now we now you can see me. Well, thank you. Um, so thanks to uh, Tyson for giving us that update. Um, Superintendent Drew and members of the board. My name is Ed John. I'm the uh, uh, interim principal at Silverton High School, and certainly my honor and privilege to uh, be the principal at uh, Silverton High School. What a what a great place to be. So you've heard lots of good things from um, uh, from uh, Tyson already, but. You know, uh, this year our focus has been uh, connecting with kids and building relationships. You know, last year we were in um, distance learning, and then this year we started with comprehensive distance learning, so it's a little bit different. And then you throw in um, Edgenuity and Canvas, it was kind of a big learning curve for kids. Before we could even get started, then we had eight days of the uh, wildfires. And then a little later on, we dealt with the um, with the ice storm, but the kids have persevered and um, working hard to help kids be uh, successful. You know, uh, in the beginning, we knew that kids were really kind of struggling and they were just feeling disconnected and uh, didn't like the new format and didn't like being in school. And so uh, we had a goal of kind of a rescue mission and try to uh, help kids get reconnected. And so we, we actually had teams of two go out and, and do home visits to uh, homes to talk to kids and parents about the importance of staying connected, get online, sign in, uh, have good attendance and do that work. Although no one seemed to be really excited about the Google Meets, but um, uh, we persevered and I think they persevered. But that was the focus of uh, getting kids connected and our staff is just at a focus of building relationships. My theory is uh, no significant learning takes place prior to a significant uh, relationship. And so that was a focus of the staff is how can we, hey, that's not so bright. Uh, how can we build those relationships and, and feel like um, the kids feel like um, we really want them in school. So that was our fake, uh, that was our, focus is building those relationships. Uh, so then um, we, we transitioned into kind of the next step of, of uh, getting ready for hybrid. And so that's been the focus the last uh, few months, even though we've only been in hybrid one week. And in a minute, Charlie's gonna tell you about uh, our first week in hybrid, but our, our focus was getting ready for it. And so our reopening team under the direction of uh, Dr. Kristen Barnes uh, worked with us every week, every Monday, 7.30 to 8.30, and thought of every possible thing we can do to prepare for uh, reopening. And then actually uh, had some subcommittees, uh, orientation committee. We wanted kids to feel like 
it's going to be a safe place to come back. And so uh, health and safety was our focus and having all those safety protocols in place so that kids felt it is safe to come back because you know they've been in uh, uh, CDL for a year. And so now to come back, uh, we wanna be able to assure them that it is going to be safe. So that was the focus getting ready for that. Um, you know, uh, the first half of the year, we really worked on social emotional learning. As you can imagine, being isolated for a year without any connections with friends, um, we had to spend some time on social emotional learning. And so that was a real focus in our advisory groups. And, um, you know, kids, if you ask them, who are the teachers you really know, you know, it probably start with their AG teacher because, you know, they could have four different teachers every semester, but they had their AG teacher for four years. And so that was somebody that they really made a connection with. And then certainly the counselors as well. But uh, AG teachers are the ones that reached out a lot, uh, checked on grades and attendance of their students, even if they may not have them in regular core class, just check with them. How are you doing? I noticed that you're kind of struggling in this area. What can I do to help and provide some support and resources? Um, one of the things I appreciate about the staff is how they've um, embraced the uh, curriculum mapping. And then next year we'll go to kind of step two of that, but really fits into the whole notion of um, uh, PLC groups, professional learning groups. And so I think that's gonna give them kind of an anchor starting point. And then next year we move to the next step of that. And uh, I really appreciate um, those four ladies that are doing that work. In fact, I just had an hour conversation with Missy on Friday and um, she's quite a resource that we have. I appreciate Scott making that happen for the administrators. Um, you know, one of the neat things uh, today at, uh, um, I think it was 2.45, uh, Dan came over and we got to recognize uh, Kevin Ortega as the high school educator of the year. Uh, Kevin does an amazing job. And so um, the SFEA folks um, uh, recognized him and said some things and, and Dan did as well. And, and one of the things that Kevin did earlier this year was uh, he had community write every senior a letter. And so it's not just some parents in the community, but uh, it could be the produce manager at Ross or the uh, guy that checks your, uh, your uh, air pressure at um, Les Schwab, but a variety of people wrote these letters to our seniors. Kevin, bless his heart, proofread every letter before we mailed them home to uh, the seniors. But it's just basically, you know, we know you've had a rough year. We know it's been difficult with uh, CDL and, and being isolated, but hang in there. Graduation's coming June 10th and we have confidence in you and we care about you and we're pulling for you. So hang in there. And, and I think that meant a lot to our seniors and, and even some parents wrote me and said, hey, that was a great act, act, idea, great activity. So appreciate Kevin orchestrating that. Uh, Eric mentioned uh, athletic teams, they're off and rolling. Uh, we finished um, winter fall sports and now we're into uh, spring. And I think some tennis matches were happening today and I'm going to softball games on Wednesday, but it's nice to see uh, sports of this Saturday night. We had a uh, football game and the uh, parents of our senior football players and the parents of our senior uh, cheerleaders were all recognized uh, just before the game. And so it was nice we were able to do that. Uh, we can't fill up the stands yet, but uh, at least we were able to have the parents there for that activity. Um, you know, last year's uh, graduation rate was um, uh, 92 percent. Um, you know, the state average is uh, 80 percent. So 92 is better than that, but we're not going to pat ourselves on the back with 92 percent. Uh, we'll pat ourselves on the back when we get to 100 percent on June 10th. Have I mentioned June, June 10th yet? Um, but, you know, our counselors say we got five seniors that they're worried about but they're talking to them, they're encouraging them, they're having them come in for what I like to call um, hybrid plus, where they come in for some intervention and some extra support. But uh, our goal is to have every one of our uh, seniors walk across that stage on, uh, on June 10th. I sent you that um, demographics page, you know, we have 1,272 students, 
1,024 uh, in hybrid. We only have 90 in CDL. I was thinking we would have more than that, but I think kids felt it's safe to come back and so most of them wanna come back. So 90 in CDL and 97 in Fox Online. I think we have 14 kids at the uh, transition program at Mount Angel and uh, 44 kids at Sequoia Falls. So that's a great resource. And that's one of the neat things about Silver Falls School District. They find resources to support our kids. You know, not every uh, square peg fits in a round hole. I don't know if that analogy makes sense, but uh, to me, it means uh, some kids need other options. And one of the neat things I, about, I appreciate about Sir Falls School District is they look for options to support every kid. So you saw our um, ethnic breakdown and, and number of kids on IEPs and 504s and, and ELL, um, but we, our care team really works hard at identifying kids that need support and then what do we do to provide those resources. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to highlight. I, I think uh, uh, Eric mentioned um, some of the programs and, and I think he mentioned the band programs that we had uh, six different students that placed first in their uh, solo competition. I don't think he mentioned that uh, our choir has our uh, uh, choral errors. They placed uh, first in the uh, competition and they'll be going to state uh, to compete against other uh, champions from other school districts. Um, <laughs> we had five students placed first at the Agricultural Technology and Mechanical Systems Career Development event. That's a mouthful, but uh, our CTE programs are doing an amazing job. Uh, again, the, the variety of resources that our school district provides for our students is, is uh, really amazing. Uh, this time of year, we're getting lots of students um, sharing with us uh, their acceptance letters to different universities and colleges and different scholarships that they're receiving. Uh, just to mention a few, Trevor Ortega is a National Merit Scholarship winner. Isaac Looney is a National Merit finalist. Sophia Borgstedt won the Hiroshio Alger National Scholarship Award, which is a $25,000 award. Um, Hayden Forster and Sophia Bork said both are Ford Foundation. They actually had Ford Foundation interview today. So I'll have to touch base with them tomorrow to see how their interview went. But we're getting lots of students with uh, scholarships and um, college acceptance letters. Uh, I mentioned reopening team, appreciate them so much. And um, you know, our department coordinators, we had a great department coordinator meeting today. And what I appreciate about them is they, are representing their department, but they also want to work together and what can we, how can we make decisions that support our entire school rather than worrying about my specific department. We try to come to consensus and then have kind of a united front of here's what we, we as a team have uh, decided. But, you know, any success that we have this year, I think it goes to the staff. Um, what what a supportive group of staff members. Uh, I talked to Sione on the phone uh, or email him or text him uh, each week. In fact, I think he's watching the school board meeting tonight. And I told him that, you know, Sione, you're coming into an amazing job. Uh, this is a school district that people would uh, die to be at. And um, I know I've enjoyed my uh, time here and um, and I know he is excited to join the uh, Silverton Foxes team. Um, you know, I also want to mention uh, ASB under the leadership of, uh, of Heather Basher and the work that they've done. And by the way, this is National, um, what is it, National Student Leadership Week. And so Heather and I did a little video to uh, thank our ASB kids for the work that they do and uh, helping kids stay connected. So lots of people to thank for the work that they're doing and helping kids be successful and help kids feel connected. And you know, now that we're back in hybrid, teachers are saying it's so good to have kids back in the building. We're so much more productive when we see them face to face than a little two inch square like I'm seeing you right now. And, um, and I know kids are excited about being back too. We're all looking forward to next year, everyone, uh, uh, being back full time. 
So um, let me ask uh, Charlie to kind of share how he felt uh, maybe the first week of uh, hybrid went and anything else that you wanted to share. Charlie? Oh, Charlie Patrick is uh, uh, a senior. He's a soccer player. He's an uh, ASB member and um, just somebody I've enjoyed to get to know the last couple of years. Charlie? Yeah, thank you, Mr. John. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, as a senior walking in um, to the school, it's different. Um, I kind of got the chance to walk through going to a to a soccer meeting and you if you've ever been to London, you would know that it looks like the streets of London when you walk in there. There's passing lanes, there's stickers everywhere. And your first impression is just wow, like this is complicated. But once you get in there, I came by uh, Tuesday and Wednesday um, as an ASB member to greet the new students coming in. They're handing out gum. Um, asking questions, getting kids to their classes where they didn't know that where they were. New students who had been part of the high school for eight months but hadn't stepped foot in the building yet. So we're leading them to their classrooms and just, you could see, even though they're wearing their masks, you could see the excitement, you could see the smiles under their faces. And as a senior, I'll be honest, it's difficult to come back. It's hard, You're, I'm already committed to university, um, your classes are easier as you're ending the year out, your grades are almost finalized coming into this next quarter, it's difficult to come back. But my excitement is for the underclassmen, for those juniors who get to come back and experience and start to experience um, some social, some, some of their friends, their teachers coming in and being there, um, et cetera. So that was my favorite part about coming back just getting to see the smiles under the masks um, of those students and uh, just um, just being there. So on that same note, um, coming to the building, the teachers really care. The teachers care a lot about the safety of the students um, because they fought so hard and worked so hard to be able to do this safely. Um, and they care a lot. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of distancing. Students are excited, you know, they're getting close together but the teachers are really making sure that it stays safe. Kids hands stay sanitized. People stay washing their hands. People stay six feet apart. Masks stay up. Um, there's no moving around the classrooms and um, the teachers care a lot. And I think the students are taking notes from that um, and realizing that this is uh, such a delicate situation, um, especially with sports happening right now and kids being exposed through that because um, there's different, different rules with OSAA and so I think teachers realize it's a delicate situation and the students are catching on to that and the students are really making sure that they can stay um, within the school. So overall, my, my experience coming back has been within my two days so far, um, has been positive. Um, even though I'm a senior and it's difficult to come back, um, I'm, I'm very excited for the upcoming classes and the chance that they get to have to experience some social before the end of the, before the, end of the summer. So um, that's really all I have to say. And um, yeah, is there any questions for me um, about my experience with the school so far? Where are you going to college, Charlie? Um, I'm going to be attending the Clark Honors College um, at the University of Oregon. Um, I, got, I got the presidential scholarship and uh, we'll be attending and hopefully able to uh, have a great time there. So, yeah. Congrats. Another duck in town. <laughs> go Ducks. Yeah. Go Ducks. Go Ducks. Hey, thanks, Charlie. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Any have questions you have of me? No, I mean for me. Thanks, Mr. Right. Thank you for the opportunity to share and thank you for allowing me to be at Silverton High School this year. It's been my pleasure. I do I do have a quick question. Um is this the last time we'll see Mr. John um, you know, present to the board this year? before the um, end of the school year? Uh, probably for this year, but uh, okay. yeah, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, wanna, I, I do wanna thank you for stepping in um, at a time we needed somebody to be stable in this situation. Um, and I think it speaks a lot to our community, um, you know, that you've been able to, you know, show up at our high school and, and you know, give the this, this staff the support they need um, in this extraordinary time. So thank you for being there. Um, and I just wanted to, 
to say that to you if I don't see you again until graduation. <laughs> so right thank you very much. Thanks, Shelley. I appreciate that. And I've received several emails from different board members, and I just really appreciate the support. And um, it's been my pleasure to be here. And, and I've, uh, I just feel like, you know, I, my first principal job was uh, in 1981. So that's, you don't have to be good at math to figure that's 40 years. But, you know, I have really enjoyed this year, even though there's been so many challenges. Um, and we're doing the good work, you know, and um, uh, and so it's been my pleasure to, uh, as, as Scott says, uh, here to serve you. So um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank, thank you. you. you Great. Well, next on the agenda, item seven, we have SFBA. So uh, Michelle, welcome. Hey, good evening, everyone. Hey there. I'm, <laughs> I was just texting Dan saying that Ed's a, a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to uh, touch on a couple of things that Ed actually said. Um, first of all, when he was talking about students who um, had made such awesome achievements, I heard a name of one of my third graders from my very first year of teaching, Sophia Borgstahl um, mentioned. And so that was really exciting to hear. Um, that's one of the things that I love about teaching in Silver Falls is you, you do kind of get to keep up with the kids um, as, they, as they get older and as they go on to high school. So that was really exciting. Um, I'm gonna send her an email just to congratulate her. Um, but the other, the other thing that was pretty exciting that um, I got to participate in a little bit today is, was um, announcing some of the educators of the year uh, for this year. So SFEA asks for nominations each year and um, it doesn't have to just be from, from teaching colleagues, it can be uh, from anybody who works in the district um, and so teachers from all over the district are nominated for uh, four different categories. We've got uh, the primary educator of the year, which is a teacher with a teacher or um, or specialist. It doesn't just have to be a classroom teacher. It could be a counselor, it could be, um, you know, a, a behavior specialist or, or anybody who works with kids and is a licensed uh, staff member. And so we have our, our K-2 Educator of the Year, our Intermediate 3-5 um, Educator of the Year, Middle School Educator of the Year, and High School Educator of the Year. And so Dan and I got to uh, surprise my friend and colleague this morning, Katie Ross, uh, who was the Middle School Educator of the Year. Um, she wasn't quite sure what was going on because she came into the into the gym and it was pitch black and we started playing music and somebody shot off like a, um, a confetti popper thing and the lights were still off so she had a little bit of a panic moment um, but we had a really really fun time um, surprising her this morning um, and then uh, Dan and Tina Howell who's our um, rep at Mark Twain got to announce the primary uh, educator of the year and that was uh, Donna Becker who is a second grade teacher at Mark Twain. So that was that was uh, an exciting announcement that they got to make and then uh, this afternoon um, Dan and Frank Petrick um, got to announce that Kevin Ortega was the the high school educator of the year. Um, I'm not going to tell you who our intermediate uh, educator of the year is yet because we're making that announcement tomorrow morning, um, first thing, but we will we'll let you know after, <laughs> after that announcement is made just so that person is still surprised. Um, so that has been just a really, a really fun thing, um, you know, about kind of this time of year is, is reflecting on the good work that people have been doing and um, and just getting to celebrate some of those things. Um, another thing that we have coming up soon um, are 
the, it's very relevant to you all, um, is our school board candidate forum that SFEA hosts each time there's a school board election, um, or we have in, in the recent years. So that's going to be coming up on um, April 22nd uh, in the evening at 7 p.m. Um, and of course, all of you who are not participating, um, Jennifer, <laughs> the rest of you um, are definitely welcome to log in and, and uh, hear from the candidates um, so that you can kind of, you know, get a get some um, yeah, get some insight on the folks who, who are running to um, be the next people to sit on this board. Um, and so that, that will be happening next Thursday evening. Um, and we have uh, invited our SFEA members as well as community members to submit questions for those um, individuals to, to answer during the forum. Um, and so we're very excited to, to hear from those uh, candidates, just, you know, about what, um, what being on the school board, you know, means, means for them and, and what, um, just kind of what they're passionate about. And, um, yeah, so that'll be, and that'll be a fun event next week, um, to log in. I think that we will also be recording it. So if you aren't able to, to log in live, um, we should have a link for people to, to be able to uh, catch that later. Um, let's see. So as always, um, life is full of interesting, <laughs> interesting experiences, right? And this year, as we all know, is full of many, many challenges. Um, most of which we as, as a group have been able to work through um, pretty well, um, but we've kind of arrived at a place where uh, the, the need for official policies and, uh, and, um, and, and practices uh, between union and district relationships are necessary. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give you all a little bit of a heads up that you're going to be hearing from some teachers during the public comment uh, section of this meeting, um, just about a challenge that uh, we have been experiencing um, that, you know, there's always gonna be times where the perspective of the teachers in the union is gonna look a little different from the perspective of, of district leadership. And so I just wanted to let you guys know that we've arrived at one of those places um, and we have official policies for that exact reason and for those very circumstances. So we get to test those out. <laughs> um, but just so you know, the, the conversations are still amenable. Um, you know, we're, we're still working through many things together and, um, and that is our intent to continue uh, throughout, you know, throughout this process and also um, as other challenges arise throughout the rest of the year. Um, so I'm not going to go into really any more depth than that, other than just to kind of give you um, a heads up that you'll, you'll be hearing from some teachers um, who are impacted tonight during public comment. And if you have any questions, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, but um, that maybe maybe to be less vague, um, we, we're going to have some, some teachers who are expressing concern with uh, the Robert Frost, Mark Twain uh, teacher assignments. And so that's, there we go, that's, that's less vague. Um, but I would like for you to hear that directly from them. So, um, any questions for me? No, none for me. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else sort of raising their hand or indicating otherwise, but thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Have thank a good you. night. Yes, you too. All right. Well, next up we have OSEA uh, with our mm -hmm. other Michelle. 
I think she's on. I think I saw that you were on the show. Debbie, did you get an email saying she was actually going to speak? I did not. OK. Michelle said that she is going to, um, she didn't have anything to say. Okay. So. All right, well, that brings us to our first public comment. And so, uh, Maddie, you were going to pop up the instructions. We are going to extend the options for contacting us, requesting uh, the ability to address the board. Uh, beyond the, the email that we've been doing, we're also going to open up the chat window briefly so that you have the option of indicating through chat that you would like to speak as well. So to request to speak, uh, post your first and last name into the chat box. For example, John Smith, or you can do like we've always done, which is to email Debbie at Bellop underscore Debbie at silverfalls.k12.org.us. Uh, the, your comments, please not in the chat box, um, just your name, that'd be appreciated. And we have, uh, yeah, okay, I'm unmuted. We have a few so far, Jonathan. Would you like to get started right away? Yeah, I think if we have some already queued up, we can certainly get started and then you'll just have to keep us posted as the queue runs dry. All right, great. First up is uh, Amy Amano. Jonathan, do you need to read the statement? Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Was... Yes, I think I should. Uh, All right, I great. So, uh, OK, we are glad you're here and welcome you to address the board at this time with your ideas, opinions, questions, concerns, or compliments. Remember that we all model the way our students, the way for our students, and we ask that you share your thoughts in a respectful way. The board's role during public comment is to listen. Rarely will you get an immediate response to information. If there is follow-up necessary, we will direct our superintendent to do that. In order to ensure equity among speakers, the board will limit remarks to three minutes per individual. If a group of three or more wishes to appoint a representative to speak on its behalf, we will extend the time for remarks to five minutes. And there is a second public comment later in the agenda specific to discussion and action item w. Uh, I did uh, real quickly uh, regarding the 30 second warning. Uh, I'm going to give, a, yeah, I'm going to give a verbal 30 second warning and then I'll say time. Thank you. Okay. okay. It, I saw that Shelly Nealon had her hand up before um, I was about to come on. Right. Actually, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I, it's delaying. Sorry, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I just had a process question, um, so I'm glad you read. I was trying to stop you to read the, <laughs> the public comment um, document. Um, but the to request to speak, post your first and last name to the chat box. That's a new process that we have. Is that, um, I, I didn't know that we were doing that. And on my screen, I have um, that right in my face. All the rest of you are really small. If we could take that down so I can see the speakers, that would be great. So that's just a Zoom setting. So Absolutely. I can, okay. I can stop sharing that. OK, that would be great. Yeah, because I'd like to see the speakers if they're going to be speak. Ah, oh, there we go. OK. Um, yes. OK. Thank you. I just had to get that cleared up. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm Amy Amano and I'm from Robert Frost. I'm the librarian there. Um, I will be a librarian at two schools for next year for Robert Frost and for Mark Twain, um, which I think is gonna be an extra challenge because of um, needing that extra time with little kids and um, extra time to, to get things um, going for K-5. Um, but besides that, uh, Robert Frost has been a really great school for relationships and for teens and um, has had really uh, high morale. And um, what happened after um, we learned where, where different people were being placed, uh, a lot of times moving to a drastically different grade level, um, it just has felt like um, a death. Um, it's that people are really stunned. 
So even those who are happy enough with their placement are having sort of a survivor's guilt and um, just it's just really been a process that we didn't expect at all. Um, we expected things to move, you know, within our grade levels somewhat that maybe you'd have to, you know, stay in fourth grade, but move to the other school or something. But we've had many, many teachers that are moved to something that's completely different and it made them feel devalued and like um, a cog in a machine or um, those kinds of things. So I, I, we just, we want people to know that um, we're hoping, we're still hopeful that there can be some um, resolution to this, but that, um, you know, there are, the words that I've heard are hurt, depressed, devalued, anxious, um, still trying to function as we finish out this year. And that's on top of all the other challenges that we've been facing. So for the benefit of students, what, we, what we're what um, we concerned about is that we need experts on the ground when kids come back. And that many people feel that the time that it's gonna take to become an expert, first grade teacher or third grade teacher or whatever, when they've never taught that before is gonna be time lost for our kids. So um, those are just a few of the, of the thoughts swirling around at our school and the things that I'm really concerned about because of the compassion I feel and the pride I feel. 30 um, seconds. For, for our educators. Um, the people that I teach with, my colleagues are amazing. And it's not that they can't move to another grade level, but it's going to be rough. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Okay, next up we got uh, Michelle uh, Klum or Klum. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, sorry. There we go. She's coming in now. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, great. Okay, awesome. Um, I am just wanting to talk to you a little bit about um, what Amy was talking about and the effects that um, this recent change has had on some of the staff at Robert Frost and me in particular. So um, for the past six years, I've been happily teaching third grade. And in this last year, what's you know, it's been a tough year, but what's really gotten me through is knowing what I'm doing, knowing third grade, knowing the standards so well that I can make adjustments where I need to, um, and my love for teaching third grade, and my love for these kids, my relationship with these kids. Um, the reason I was able to kind of bounce back and be uh, the support for you know, 25 third graders is because I felt confident, I felt secure, I felt supported, and I had my tribe around me. So even when things, you know, were hard, I really did feel that support and I've been fine. I feel like I've, I've kind of weathered this pretty well. Um, until I received my teaching assignment, um, I indicated on my survey that I wanted to teach third grade. Um, either at Mark Twain or at Robert Frost, knowing that, you know, obviously there might need to be some adjustments. But um, when, I, when I received the assignment and I was teaching first grade at Mark Twain, um, that's multiple grade levels below what I'm teaching now. And it really just pulled the rug underneath from, I mean, I just, I was devastated instantly. Um, and, it just knocked that confidence that I feel that I was telling you was getting me through for the past, you know, year through all of this adversity. Um, it just kind of knocked me on my, on my butt. And I have felt, um, I don't know, just disrespected, devalued, just like, um, 
kind of a way I've never felt before um, with the whole process. So um, the time that it takes you to develop that kind of strength as a teacher, um, the, t the energy, the heart and soul, the hours reading literature for the grade 30 level. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I just, what our students really need is happy teachers. Happy teachers teaching a grade that they understand, that they know so well. They know the, the standards and can tweak it and can produce engaging assignments. So I just want to say how important that is. It's just super important. So <laughs> thank you for listening. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Next up, we have Tina Howell coming in now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm first going to ask if I can have five minutes because I'm representing nine teachers with what I have to say tonight. Is that possible? Okay, thank you. I'm going to be reading statements that each teacher submitted to me, the ones that wanted to speak. So my name is Tina Howell. I'm the ELD teacher at Mark Twain, and I'm also one of the union reps. And so um, it's been very emotional and hard to watch the lack of transparency in the decision um, to place 50% of next year's Mark Twain teachers into positions that are two or three grade levels above their current grade level. It has hurt our staff and our, our school climate. Um, my hope is just to bring awareness to this so that you all understand what we're going through. Um, so my first statement is from Carolyn Jones, our school counselor. She said, before the recent rollout of the staffing list for Robert Frost and Mark Twain, teachers were asked their preferences for grade level building and teaching partner. However, when the list was made public, a great percentage of the teacher's preferences were not honored. And in fact, their assignments to teach two or three grade levels above their current level has created unnecessary angst, frustration, stress, and trauma. Also, trust has been broken on so many levels. This is heartbreaking because it was totally unnecessary and could have been handled so differently with a positive outcome for both buildings and for the children who will attend these schools from Brianna Davis, our kindergarten teacher and a recent teacher of the year. None of the requests on my survey were honored. I asked to go to Robert Frost to stay in kindergarten and to stay with my teaching partner. Instead, I was moved to second grade at Mark Twain. This makes me feel unvalued. I was told that we were split from teams to get us out of our comfort zones, but that's where we've been this entire year. Being in a new building with new staff would have done that even without moving me to a new grade level, two years above where I currently teach. My heart is in kindergarten. I'm not just a teacher, I am a kindergarten teacher. And I take pride in that. If for some reason my heart changes, it should be my choice to switch grades. Like all parents of students in this district, we want our children to be in a classroom with a teacher who is confident and competent at their grade level, especially after a year of struggling in online school. Preston Ward, a current first grade teacher was placed at third grade. And he says, students need a teacher who is both passionate and knowledge, knowledgeable about what they are teaching. This will be even more true of, after two school years of distance learning. Um, students in the coming school year and beyond need a teacher who is a master of their craft to support and raise up those in our community who are struggling. This is our goal. Arbitrarily shifting teachers around to areas that are completely unfamiliar um, accomplishes the opposite of that goal. Donna Becker, a second grade teacher who is today announced as teacher of the year was moved to fifth grade. She's never taught anything above second grade. She said, I've been teaching in Silverton for 12 years. Eight of those have been in second grade. I feel that I'm very effective in second grade. I've been placed in fifth for next year. I do not want to be. I do not feel confident or competent, which makes me less effective. Next year, students need a very effective teacher to find and fill in the gaps. I need to be in a grade that I know inside and out. For me, that is second grade. We've been told that these placements were made to create effective teams and those are not. Nicole Guyer, second grade teacher is placed into fourth grade. 
She said, I was placed at fourth grade for next year. I am currently the only bilingual teacher on our staff and I use my Spanish with students all day long to clarify directions and provide support. By the time students reach fourth grade, they don't need as much Spanish support in the classroom. It doesn't make sense to move me to a grade where my skills are not utilized as they have been for the past nine years. Providing language support in primary language and making connections lessens student anxiety and frustration. I work directly with her every single day as the ELD teacher, and I totally agree how important it is to keep her at second grade. Um, next is from Brooke Anderson, who teaches kindergarten. She said, the idea that Mark Twain and Robert Frost would become two K-5 schools is nothing new. We had heard about this potential change years ago. Although it was a hard pill to swallow, knowing that each building staff would be split up, we all knew it had to be done because that is what was best for kids. After seeing the teaching assignments for each building, it does not appear teachers were placed into grade levels, teams, and buildings with that mentality. It takes many years to establish yourself within a specific grade level. I know that. I taught third grade for 14 years, and it takes a long time to become an expert. The new teaching assignments are putting an incredible amount of teachers in situations that are completely new to them. How can we create two highly effective K-5 buildings when the majority of the teachers are placed 30 seconds and grade levels that they don't have any way to navigate? By not putting our teachers first, we did not put our kids first. The kids are the reason why we do what we do. It's time for us to do what's best for kids and give them highly effective teachers at each grade level. We just want it to be made right. I know my time is up, but this is a great place to work. Our teachers love being in Silverton and we just want to teach the grade level where we have passion and expertise and love. So thank you. Thank you, Tina. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Okay, next up is Carrie Litchie. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Can everyone hear me? Hi, Carrie. Hi. Um, so I hope that this is the right time. Um, I am actually a parent um, of um, a Mark Twain and a Robert Frost student. So is now the time for me to speak or, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to come on. Um, I actually had sent an email um, probably to some of you or most of you. Um, so my plan, I guess, is to kind of just speak on that. Um, again, I don't know if all of you received it. And if you did, I'm sorry if I'm repeating. But I just wanted to speak as a parent um, of both a Mark Twain and Robert Frost student um, that I was aware of the, of the split of the two schools. Um, and when I had heard that um, teachers were assigned different grade levels, um, it broke my heart. Um, I feel like the um, teachers are um, in the grades that they are for a reason. Um, that's their passion. Um, they're really good at it. Um, and so for them to then be moved two to three grade levels um, just, just really hurt me. Um, and I don't think we would expect any of our kids to do that. We wouldn't ask a second grader to just skip all the other grades and go to fourth or fifth grade. Um, so I guess I just am kind of unsure of why we would ask um, teachers to do that, especially in a year that we've already had um, or a year and a half um, of COVID and them teaching, um, you know, kind of virtually and in this new, new realm. Um, I know a lot of them pour their heart and souls, not only into teaching and to the kids, um, but also their classroom and spend a lot of their own personal money to get, you know, different learning um, tools and supplies to help all these kids and make them succeed. Um, and obviously, if you're a kindergartner teacher, um, you have all that, you, you can't take that to third or fourth grade. It's going to be irrelevant at that point. Um, our teachers are our role models um, for the kids. And um, I just, um, I wanna go back. I think Ed John had said this, if I heard him right, he mentioned something about that this is a really good school district. People wanna be here, they wanna come here. Um, and it just, it feels like, um, you know, if we do this switch with all of the parent, or excuse me, all of the teachers, um, that's just gonna kind of rock the world. And I'm afraid that it's just gonna kind of, turn it upside down um, and that won't be the case. 
Um, so I just kind of wanted to, to say that and would love for something to be reconsidered. Um, I understand some, some movement, but not, not more than 50% um, of the teachers um, to be moved like they were. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. All right, next up is Aaron Scott. Hi, I just um, wanted to make one other, my um, Tina ran out of time, so she didn't get to mention what um, I said, but the, I had a little bit of a different perspective that I just wanted to share with you. Um, as a teacher who is fortunately able to stay in my own grade, I teach kindergarten at Mark Twain. Um, I am being moved to Robert Frost, which was not my choice, but um, that's what's happening. Um, I'm still deeply saddened and disappointed in the lack of transparency, trust, and respect our district has shown the teachers in this process. That does not create a healthy environment to, for teachers to thrive. Um, the point that I wanted to make though that hasn't really been mentioned is that many of us who live in town will have kids that will go to either Mark Twain or Robert Frost. Um, in our building alone, one of those teachers is now placed at the school where her kids will, where her kids will go. Um, so it's frustrating that due to a board policy, our children are not guaranteed to be able to move with us, especially when this decision was made for, for us and not with us. So I would just like that taken into consideration. Um, I live in Mark Twain. My daughter goes, should go to Mark Twain. Now I am being moved to Robert Frost. And I believe that just for the respect of the teachers and the staff, that if we choose to take our kid, kids to the school that we are assigned to, I believe that that should happen um, and priority should be given to staff members, especially since many of these were not, this was not my decision, so. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Melissa Briggs. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I just wanted to say that I was a member of the original work group that of community members that got together to decide whether or not Mark Twain or Robert Frost should transition to K-5s. And we looked at all of the um, positives and negatives in that. And we immediately knew that this was a big positive for the kids but we also immediately knew that it was a potential big negative for the teachers and the staff. And this, that work group I think met two years ago and we specifically made a point to make sure that we, we recommended to the board. I actually came to you, the board, um, I think two years ago with um, Superintendent Belando at the time and was part of that recommendation to the board to start the transition. And one of the recommendations that we specifically made was to make sure there was a plan to support teachers. And I would just really encourage the board and the administration to rethink this and rethink a way that we can support teachers um, during this time and during this transition because that was the intent all along. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. And we don't have anyone else. Okay, well, very good. Appreciate all the input, everybody. I just closed chat, so we won't get anyone else. Okay, thanks, Maddie, appreciate it. So, Next up, we have our administrator and staff reports, and that's going to begin with our superintendent, Scott Drew. Thanks, Jonathan. Good evening. Uh, first off, I just wanted to say um, thank you to those teachers who just shared. 
I think that was very thoughtfully done. And I know you spent a, a, a fair amount of time putting together your thoughts and putting together the thoughts of your colleagues. And, and I just want you to know that, uh, that, that I hear you and, and you know, just want you to know that as we work towards solutions in this, um, just need you to know that we are addressing those on an individual basis. And our hope is that we come out of this um, with, with a solution that's, that's strong and that works for, for as many as we can. So I just wanted to make sure that I, I, I paid attention, paid uh, those comments uh, the attention that they deserve and out of respect for the teachers that shared and, and the time it took to, to formulate your thoughts. So thank you. Um, I just have a couple of updates. Um, number one is um, we just concluded our hiring of three instructional leaders. Uh, two of them you already know. We have Sione Thompson, who will be the next principal of Silverton High School. We have Mandy Pack, the next principal of Robert Frost. And the third one, I can't say publicly yet because we're dotting some I's and crossing some T's, but I will tell you that the person had the weekend to think about it. And of course I was on pins and needles, but uh, I received a call at uh, around 10 o'clock this morning and I almost had tears in my eyes to be honest with you um, because it's the end of a very long process. Uh, this process started back in October, uh, believe it or not, um, uh, with our recruiting efforts uh, to assemble candidate pools for each one and to take feedback and to build a process that would that would give us uh, an instructional leader on the other end. And it was really great to have the community's involvement and the staff's involvement. It was a truly inclusive process. And I couldn't be happier with the three, three instructional leader additions that we have for the Silver Falls School District. And, and they are all uh, top-notch uh, uh, professionals and we can't wait for them to get started. Um, Sione will be starting early, just so you know. He'll be starting probably around mid-May. Um, he will be uh, meeting with stakeholder groups and sort of formulating uh, his, uh, his the connections that he makes and getting an idea of, of uh, what Silverton High School uh, <clears throat> needs. And um, so he will be doing that. Ed John will continue with the day-to-day -day operations for the end of the school year. And that'll enable uh, Sione to really focus on building relationships and, and kind of getting a lay of the land. Um, and he's super excited. I think he might even be here tonight. Uh, Sione, if you're here, welcome. Um, and in terms of the, the uh, other two, um, we're in contact uh, with them as we speak and we are setting up uh, the, the supports that they'll need to transition. And, I just need to keep in mind that they have their current jobs to finish up and and uh, we would expect nothing less than their best for the districts that they serve and um, but they're super excited as well. Um, one of the things that's taking up the most of our time right now is the new guidance from ODE which has taken the six feet social distancing down to three feet but the six feet social distancing requirement is still there for lunch so that poses an enormous issue for us to tackle, and we're working with that right now. Right now, we're working with principals to ascertain the square footage and the capacity of each building, and then figure out, figuring out all the ancillary things. Most important one is transportation. All of you saw my, uh, my communication, which was a joint statement from Kyle Palmer, our mayor, myself, and Stacy Palmer, the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, just informing our community that we really need help. This is a nationwide problem that we're facing and it won't end this spring. It will carry on through the summer. It will carry on to the fall until we have hired enough drivers uh, to effectively service our community. And, and just so we're clear, uh, school board, um, we have a legal ob obligation to provide transportation to every child that needs it. And so that's a legal obligation. It's every child's civil right to be able to have transportation for free to school each day. And, and, and we're really working hard to solve this issue. Um, with the three feet, if we're able to accommodate uh, more students in the building, we will, uh, and we will do that. And we should know soon. So our community should be on the lookout for a communication from me in the next week or so, uh, once we've determined <clears throat> 
one if it's possible we think that it, the chances are 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 looking pretty good whether or not we can do it in every single building we're, we're figuring that out now um we've also had since the joint statement ran 12 individuals have contacted kevin palmer who's our administrator for transportation and he's working hard to accelerate the process for getting them trained getting them uh, licensed and up to speed background checked and everything else so just know it's a whirlwind pace right now. Uh, Durham is in a really good spot. Uh, leadership is looking uh, uh, good and we've had uh, multiple meetings with them. Kevin will still remain um, as our go-to person, the one making the ultimate decisions um, as per our agreement with, um, with the parent company of transportation. And, and that seems to it looks like it's a really great collaboration between the two to be honest so it's it's really great to see um so just know more updates are coming uh for that um and i the golden number for for drivers is 10. i'm not sure if i just mentioned that so 10 fully licensed background checked ready to go that's how many we need to double our capacity to start bringing in kids on uh, more days of the week. So it would go from two days a week to four days a week. Again, we have not, I want to be really clear with this because I'm not saying, I won't say anything that isn't hundred percent true because this is a, uh, this is a publicly attended meeting and I want to make sure we're being very clear. I will communicate out in the next week or so uh, an exact date if that's possible. So all of those details will be spelled out explicitly for our community. Um, as well. Just so you know, with the nationwide shortage of drivers, we're competing against a couple of different things. Uh, one big one is, is the uh, packages that uh, Amazon and other companies are putting together to lure drivers, to, uh, commercial drivers for their companies. And so, you know, it's kind of hard to compete with, with a signing bonus that's two to three times the size of the one that we're offering and a higher hourly wage and, and better benefits. Um, that's what we're competing against. Uh, just to give you a frame of reference, right next door was Salem Kaiser. They are, they are short 53 routes right now, 53 routes. That is a lot. And so if you times, you know, they're about, I think 10 to 12 times the size of, of Silver Falls. I believe. So if you multiply that out or divide in our case, that'd give you about the shortage that we have. So it's pretty much the same across the board. Um, it's not just an issue with Oregon either. Um, so we're pulling out all the stops to, to do what we need to do. Because again, I'm not as concerned right now in the spring as I will be for the fall. We've got to solve this before we roll into summer. Um, and so I would just encourage our public that's watching. We have 97 participants on the call. At least that's what the number says. I would really encourage you uh, to contact Kevin Palmer, um, principal at Butte Creek, who's also our uh, administrator for transportation. If you or you know someone who might be interested in learning more about uh, driving a bus for our school district. Um, and having said that, um, I told our staff uh, who come to my open forum every Thursday at 3.30, um, that uh, once we do come up with a date, assuming everything is possible and we're able to do that, uh, that we will give uh, teachers uh, an, enough time to plan as well. And so it won't be an overnight thing. We're starting you know, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. It, it will be a reasonable amount of time for our staff to prepare for that as well. And so if you look at today uh, versus when the end of the year is coming, that decision needs to be made really soon. Um, so those are my updates. Um, the last one I wanted to mention is about budget. And I'm sure all of you have seen the co-chair's budget at 9.1 billion. We were hoping for 9.3 billion. And just so you know, as a frame of reference, every 0.1, every 10th of a billion dollars means $300,000 for Silver Falls. So that's a $600,000 shortfall for us um, right now. We, we feel that, that that number will go up to 9.3. Do we have any facts to base that on? No, all we have is the trend of what our experience has taught us in Oregon. And that is most of the time it's ended back up where, um, where we thought it might be. 
uh, and and I, I don't think there might be one year in the 15 years I've been in Oregon where that wasn't the case. Um, so we're hopeful as well. But just keep in mind that uh, we're starting that budget season. Uh, Steve Nielsen is hard at work preparing uh, a lot of the uh, different budget pieces that are going to be shared with our budget committee. And we start meeting with uh, we meet with our new members this week and um, going into a really important time. So thank you all. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Hey, Scott, I have a couple of questions for you just from your presentation. Sure, Shelley. Hey, really quick, you mentioned that uh, Kevin Palmer had potentially 12 applicants to be bus drivers, um, and he's expediting um, the process to get them certified. <laughs> um, and our magic number is 10, correct? Yes. Uh, I Spring? Yes. What, yes, Kevin just texted me uh, about a half an hour ago, said 13, actually. So that's one more than, than I had in my notes. Um, okay. So is that for the spring only? Or well, what we, are you looking for for the fall? Yeah, and what does that kind, do with routes? Sure. We have to kind of take that with a grain of salt right now because it's okay. the people that are interested. What we need is is 10 folks that are fully trained, certified, ready to go. So right. we haven't had a chance to vet them since we just sent out the communication on Friday, but okay. that's encouraging that we now have 13. Um, yeah. I could just add to that, Scott. It takes, it, takes a couple of, it takes a good couple of weeks to get everybody trained, go through the process to get their CDL and do everything that that needs to be done. So. There are some signing bonuses based on who comes in with what. If they have a CDL already in hand and, and are quicker to go, there's a little bit higher signing bonus. And that's from Durham, by the way. And so uh, Kevin has just taken it on with the Durham. Durham has their own recruiting team. We're just using kind of the Palmer name recognition of getting people locally enthused about this. And so that was really credit Kevin's connections with, with Kyle to get some local folks in here. So. Um, Durham will need to take over the hiring of those folks and and vet them through training. Oh, okay. So, what about the previous bus bus drivers before the pandemic? Who were who were those folks that maybe ahead, might want to come back? They have that we have gotten a few of those drivers back. So okay. we have we have worked on that. Um, you know, the difficulty has been. Um, you know, there's a very aging bus. I mean, they had multiple bus drivers over the age of 70 that with COVID oh. were reluctant to come back. And so it's a very right. senior, um, heavy uh, workforce. And so some of them did not want to come back. Um, Durham, mm. work, Durham not only did the signing bonuses, but they also um, did some retaining bonuses for people that are current drivers to keep current drivers. Because again, We've got Malala offering multiple, you know, large bonuses. Um, we're really in competition with a lot of neighboring districts over this issue. So it's it's a really a game of not only recruiting but also retaining. Um, more kids come back into hybrid, the more drivers that'll take also. So it's right. yeah, we were a little we were a little fortunate in that we were a little ahead of the game with high school, and so I think that we were able to because the Durham has brought in out of state drivers to cover the shortfall. Mm -hmm. But now that California is starting to open back up, our ability to get out of state drivers is, you know, that's not a sustainable solution. So if we can get some of these local drivers and local people that are interested trained so that if, if that out of state uh, pool starts to dwindle, we hopefully, you know, have some backup. And like Scott said, then the long term solution of being ready in in um, in the, the fall. fall yeah and I will say like Scott said that the attention we're getting from Durham it feels better than it was a, a couple of months ago okay thank you yep. you're welcome Shelley all right well appreciate it any other questions for Scott Thank you. Move into our financial report with Steve. Thank you, Jonathan. Good evening, everybody. 
I had a, a few items tonight, and uh, the, the first action or the first item I have is an action item, actually, and uh, there's a two and a half page executive summary. It has to do with uh, an RFP process that we did over about a three, well, about a three or four month period, including the planning that went into it, and actually longer than that in terms of um, getting ready for it. But it basically was a, a three a three part process uh, to uh, uh, put out a uh, an RFP for copier print manage print printers and print management and device management those are the three different sections copiers are referred to as multifunction devices these days and uh, the the goal would be to continue the trend of reducing printing costs in the district as well as getting standardization throughout the district that we don't currently have we have about three or four different brands and service providers in the district at the various schools uh in the district and so it's been something that we've uh, had a, a goal of doing uh for for a while now and and we we were able to get leases to line up to where a lot of them are ending this year and into next year and uh, we'll actually also have some early lease buyout options so we can get uh, most of these uh, standardized here within the next year or so so we're really excited about that i know technology is very excited brett's uh, Brett and Vasily were working very closely with us on this because these days, uh, these devices, both uh, network printers and uh, multifunction devices, are as much technology uh, driven as, as anything in terms of uh, how they uh, behave on the network and how the printer drivers work and that type of thing. So we uh, let, let tech have a, a big say in, in how uh how this uh, what 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 the needs are in terms of making it easier easier for them to service so with that being said we we worked with optimize on out of boise idaho they do independent print management uh service and help run this process for us and uh we had five companies bid in these three different areas uh, 17 companies expressed interest and so we had a pretty good pool and ultimately we did a weighting scoring, a weighted scoring method. And this document does a really good job of explaining the two different rounds that we had. And we even conducted interviews for finalists, just like we would for uh, an employee job interview. And you can see on uh, page three, uh, what the weighted scores were and what our potential savings uh, would be. So uh, what I'm, uh, what our team is recommending to you this evening is to award this uh, five year year contract in each uh, for all three phases to Pacific Office Automation, specifically with uh, sharp multifunction devices. And as for the printers, we already have a number of network printers throughout the district that they will help uh, provide service and supplies on in conjunction with technology and also help with our device management to help us manage those, get the buildings all to have the same um, goals in terms of the usage, how they use, when to print, uh, when to scan. We're also getting rid of more of the uh, the desktop printers wherever we can. That's another thing that we've been doing and we'll do more of where we can. So uh, the recommendation tonight uh, is to award the contract to Pacific Office Automation. Any specific questions on that since it's uh, an action item? Okay, thank you for your consideration on that. The next topic is uh, just the, the regular financial statements uh, for March. Uh, there's not much to talk about here in terms of the trends. Uh, the trends are the same as they have been uh, that we've talked about the last uh, several months. Uh, really the focus is more about the budget for 21 22 and the complexities that I think are as complex as any in my 20 years of, of doing this. Uh, as Scott mentioned, the, the uh, co chair's budget came out during spring break and came in at $9.1 billion, which was $200 million uh, short, uh, less than what we expected. It matched the governor's budget 9.1. So as Scott mentioned, uh, every $100 million or 0.1 uh, 
it, it equates to 300 and just over $300,000 in additional revenue or less revenue in this case for Silver Falls uh, next year at the 49% funding level. So that additional 200 million would, would make a significant difference for us. And I know there's a lot of uh, advocacy going on in, in Salem or at least over the computer and uh, COSA and, and other uh, agencies have had a, a very good track record of, of helping, you know, provide uh, documentation with regards to what current sub service levels are and the 9.3 is not even meeting current service level. So, so the track record's good. There's no guarantees, but, you know, it's still open for debate in Salem and we'll see how it turns out. Uh, so we're just just going to keep our eyes peeled and provide any information we can to help with the advocacy efforts that COSA does. So in OSBA. So the, the thing that makes it so complex, obviously, is we just don't know exactly with our enrollment situation, uh, you know, down as much as 10% this year. Uh, I can report that uh, we've had the second straight month of slight improvement. We are up a little bit. Uh, our low again was 3,540 back at the end of January, and as of the uh, as of today, we're at 3,570. So it's a very slight uh, increase over the last two months, but at least it's trending in the right direction. We have kids back in the building, buildings, and uh, it's just it's hard to forecast exactly what service model will be uh, will be at for in 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 the fall and exactly what the return rate will be. And every school is a little bit different in their situation. So we'll be talking a lot about that uh, through our budget committee meeting process. Uh, so that's just something that we'll just continue to keep an eye on. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we they passed the third round of stimulus dollars here uh, was a little over a month ago or a month and a half ago. So uh, we haven't got the exact allocation on that, but it's our understanding that K-12 school districts in Oregon will receive over two times the amount of the ESSER II funds. As a reminder, ESSER II dollars, specifically to Silver Falls School District, is $1,426,000 that can be used through September 30th, 2023. They haven't given us a final answer yet, but ODE believes we'll be able to access ESSER $3 through September 30th, 2024. If it does indeed come in at 2.4 times the amount, that's over $3 million. Haven't received the official allocation sheets for those. That will include uh, a weighted pass through to charter schools as, as, as part of that funding as well. One thing we have heard with ESSER three funds is that they are anticipating that a minimum of 20% of those dollars will need to be used for learning loss efforts for students. So that's one specific piece of guidance that has been added uh, to the previous guidance for ESSER II. I also believe as I'm developing the proposed budget, because we're going into a 49% state school funding year and because we have an enrollment loss that will impact us financially next year. It's not impacting us this year, but next year. And not knowing exactly where we'll be with our service model and return rate, I believe that there's an argument to be made that some ESSER II funds could be used as a shock absorber uh, for maintaining uh, continuity and capacity in our system. Uh, even though there might be a few schools that have slightly lower uh, student uh, teacher student ratios, uh, just because again, uh, some schools will probably come back full or close to full and others may not be quite to that point, but we really just don't know at this point. The one thing that we have been able to control and a decision that we made 13 months ago that I think has served us well is hol holding the line wherever we could on, uh, on teacher vacancies. Uh, and not rehiring those as we went into the pandemic, as we went into an online model. And so there were some positions that weren't rehired as we went through the year that has saved us some more money this year that could help us resource wise next year, but also has, it'll, you know, buy us some time as to, you know, uh, in terms of 
you know, as we learn more, you know, with, with the funding level from the state and as time passes, uh, you know, there's always more information that comes our way. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot that changes between putting together a budget in February and March and April and the start of the school year. So that's something that I think could, could help us, even though there's other uses as well, like the learning loss and, you know, PPE, those types of things, uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, I think some different different areas that the ESSER dollars will be able to help us. It's really similar to what happened in uh, during the Great Recession. Uh, we saw the cuts to the state budget for about two or three years straight. Every quarter they were cutting how much uh, uh, per student the, the, the schools would get, but the federal ARA dollars came into play during that time. And those were temporary, but they helped stabilize situations. And I think that's what these ESSER dollars will help us do uh, here over the next couple of years as well. I know that's a bit of a long story, but <laughs> we'll hear a lot about this as we go through uh, the budget. So with the budget process, because it's uh, been uh, a lot to try to uh, navigate and because the co-chair's budget came out quite a bit later than normal, uh, we are proposing that we have the first budget committee meeting on Thursday, May 6th, rather than Thursday, April 29th. Uh, that will still also allow us to have our second meeting on May 20th and third meeting on June 2nd. So those two meeting dates would not change. Uh, let's see here. The next next item I had was, uh, ah, yes, the pension obligation bond. <laughs> so we had our board work session on uh, Monday, March 22nd during spring break and Lauren did a great job of presenting and we had some good conversation around pension obligation bonds and that possibility. And tonight was going to be the night that I was going to bring forth a resolution uh, for us to move forward with that, but it uh, wasn't obligating us to it. We would still have a couple of months. However, the, uh, the process has been delayed by one month. So if we do decide to, uh, to move forward, uh, I would bring a resolution to you at the May board meeting and everything else would be pushed back a month. And again, we would have another couple of months beyond that before we would have to commit fully to it. Now, the reason that it got delayed was because on Monday, March 29th, PERS had their uh, monthly uh, board meeting and the actuary, Milliman, and the Oregon Investment Council came and recommended uh, that the PERS board consider dropping their assumed earnings rate, which is 7.2%. As you may recall, all of the Eco Northwest analyses were based on the 7.2% assumed earnings rate and then a particular borrowing, particular borrowing rate scenarios. They believe that the uh, assumed rate continues to, to be too high. Uh, for history, PERS history buffs, you may remember it used to be 8% back in the day. It's been 7.2 for at least a few years, but they're, they're running some scenarios for just PERS in general at, for, for what the UAL would look like under a, a smaller assumed earnings rate at 7% and 6.8%. Uh, they even give an indication on slide 122 of that meeting that it could be as low as 6.12%. But I think they're looking at high sixes possibly to adjust it and it's ultimately the PERS board's decision and they probably will not make a decision on that until July. So what does that do for this particular pension bond uh, possibility, borrowing bar possibility? Well, two, there's two different, two different options. Uh, one is we wait until that process plays out and see if per the PERS board changes their assumed earnings rate. Uh, and then the whole Eco Northwest study would have to be redone uh, and then go from there. And then three or four months would have passed and who knows what would have happened to the borrowing rates. Or uh, bond council has stated that it's acceptable for Eco Northwest at a cost of $6,000. And there's, I think, 15 districts interested would be about $400, $500 for each district to just update the study that they did with another scenario where the margins are tighter, uh, even with a, with a lesser earnings rate or a higher borrowing rate or, or both. 
so that we could get a, a look at a tighter margin. And that would give the information we would need to, you know, to analyze and possibly make a decision. So if they did reduce the assume, assumed earnings rate, it would cause the system unfunded liability to go up as well as future projected payroll rates. That's for everybody, whether we, we borrow or not. As far as the borrowing goes, nothing changes in terms of you know the schedules for assumed earnings rate. They could run those to make them look different, but really all this is based on is the actual earnings rate. You know they can they can assume whatever they want so uh, so that's why a lot of districts including ourselves have decided hey we'll go ahead and pay that four hundred dollars for eco northwest to, to 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 run that additional scenario and add it on to the report they've already done so that we can keep uh, a timeline going now and not wait that three or four months for the pers board to make a decision on their assumed earnings rates because we want to take advantage of the the rate window as it sits today it still may not play out for us, but it's it, it'll at least keep it moving. But they felt it prudent to to call a timeout at least for this this three or four week window they need uh, to take in this information, have Eco Northwest update the report, then we can come back to you, the board, and say, okay, uh, it still looks okay. Let's let's consider passing the resolution and and move on from there. So that's why it got uh, it got delayed. I know that's a lot of information, but uh, it was a curveball, uh, no doubt, uh, that, that came up just as we were poised to move to the next steps. But better to know now than and, 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 and relook at the at the data and be able to make a decision based on the latest you know, information. So I think that's uh, I think that's all I had for tonight. I definitely uh, entertain uh, questions on any of that. I know that's a the pension obligation bond is is is, is tricky. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, uh, let's go back to the last topic, the third stimulus um, yeah. work. Um, you said that a percent was dedicated to learning loss on this yeah. new the new one. That's her three. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't I didn't catch that number. Can you repeat? Uh, uh, they uh, the the in the meeting we had with ODE a uh, week before last, they said at the, the early indicator indication is that at least 20% must be used for learning loss. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Shelly, sorry. That's okay. Um, hey, just to, just if you could explain something. Um, in connection with the SR2 money, the governor has um, requested um, the leaders of the Oregon House and Senate to the legislators to allocate 250 million in state funds and 75 million from the federal government to fund the summer programming. So are those two separate funding the processes? Most of the uh, most of the state. Uh, so even before the ESSER three came out, I think there was yeah. a discussion around the state funded summer right. program. Yes, they. I would need to double check on this this other piece that you said, but I know that uh, part of this the stimulus packages there was gear money, which was the governor's. Uh, there's ESSER and gear. Gear was right. And and she had discretionary authority over a small pool of the stimulus of these stimulus funds, and um, that might be part of that. Might be going in to help uh, increase the amount they have available for the state uh, for the summer uh, summer funding that they had already allocated from the state. I'd have to double check on that, but but okay, yeah. But so most of the most of the summer uh, summer school funding, at least how they announced it early on, was was state level funding. Right. But they they very very well may be adding some federal dollars to that because that would make a lot of sense because that would address learning loss and getting right uh, credit recovery those types of things. Yeah, and I think that that was the idea behind it um, moving forward. But my other question is, um, well, and you might have to find this out too. Is would part of that money be used to provide? you know, how many kids that need it in our district, you know, public transportation, um, lunches, breakfast, you know, all of that, does that come out of our general pool? 
money or does that, would that potentially come out of those funds to cover that so it wouldn't come out of our budget? Well, generally, the, those uh, great questions. The, the food generally is runs through the, you know, the National School Lunch Reimbursement Program. Right, the whole right. Kind of arm and usually mm -hmm. has a different, you know, funding stream. I'm, it's quite possible that some of those federal stimulus monies went went into there that in this money that we're not even talking about. And I, I, I don't have those figures. Okay. To check on that, but yeah, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, transfer transportation. You know, that's already uh, part of the state school fund. You know, we reimburse 70 percent of whatever we, you know, whatever we pay. But any additional costs related to uh, mm -hmm. to that, like, you know, the, the net amount that we have to pay, uh, if it means continuity of operations or, uh, or or whatever it is we have to do to get more drivers to help Durham, you know, whatever, uh, that could be something, you know, specifically uh, the the ESSER two guidance, which I had here in front of me somewhere, I guess I don't have it here now, but it's okay. continuity of operations and maintaining staffing levels and that, that type of thing. So continuity of operations, uh, I believe that would fall into that if we if we needed some assistance. Yes. Okay. Yeah, those are, I mean, just all the thought processes that all this money can go to and how that works. So mm -hmm. we don't have all the answers. It's just throwing questions out there to potentially think about as yeah. For so Absolutely. and they're still and they're still developing the ESSER three guidance. Um, oh, okay. Finalizing that guidance and the uh, yeah. and the allocation amounts. Uh, oh, okay. The ESSER two guidance uh, became more expansive than in the first round, and mm. it's possible that ESSER three could be there could be even a mm -hmm. little more, uh, to that as well than ESSER two. So. Right. Yeah. Got it. Lots of information to come. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Lori, sorry, were you? Oh, I was just um, kind of curious what, and it's probably too early to ask the question, but I too noticed the 20% uh, for um, learning loss. And what does that exactly look like? I mean, it, it goes into, I guess I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, I, I know that we're being funded for summer school, but I would imagine learning loss is that a, I don't know, and I'd probably have to ask Scott, is that like a specialized program um, to utilize funds like that? Or is it utilized maybe in other ways? Um, yeah, I, program? Think would, I think there would be a number of options. And, and, and I think, you know, Leslie might be able to, to, to address it better than I could, but it could be, it could be an additional, uh, a teaching resource or a tutor or a program or some online tools. It could be a myriad of things, I would say. That would oh, help, very good. Help, help, help a student uh, catch up, you know, uh, if they, they fell behind where they're, you know, fell behind the benchmark or uh, just anything that they would need assistance with. It could mean, you know, some additional counseling for social emotional, those types of things. Um, oh, I'm, definitely speaking, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in these areas, but yeah. Are, happen in my mind so <laughs> so so leslie it's a very broad uh definition so far with that's our understanding is that it's going to be very broad um so that we can choose to use the money in ways that are specific to our student population so whether it's materials or or different types of um employees or you know it's really seems broad very good thank you Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. Well, we do have an action item later on regarding the uh, copier printer device management uh, contract award. So just to keep that in mind. Okay. Well, with that. We are ready to move right into our discussion items. We have a couple of them here. Uh, the first one is that this is when we are going to be uh, talking about the resolution to adopt Teacher Appreciation Week. And uh, the resolution was attached. And I am going to read it real quickly. And then uh, anybody who'd like to speak to it, of course, would be welcome to. 
So the resolution that we'll be uh, having as an action item later in the meeting says, uh, you know, that we are going to recognize, well, I'll just read it. Whereas teachers, that would be school counselors, specialists, and all licensed instructional staff, mold future citizens through guidance and education, and whereas teachers encounter students in widely differing backgrounds, and whereas our country's future depends upon providing quality education to all students, and whereas teachers spend countless hours preparing lessons, evaluating progress, counseling, and coaching students, and performing community service, and whereas our community recognizes and supports its teachers, educating the children of this community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Silver Falls School District Board of Directors proclaims May 4th through 8th, 2021, to be Teacher Appreciation Week. And be it further resolved that Silver Falls School District Board of Directors strongly encourages all members of our community to join in this observance personally expressing, expressing appreciation to our teachers for their dedication and devotion to their work. So any, anybody want to share anything or uh, anything to say or add? Yes, Jennifer. So I've been thinking about this. This is, um, I've completed one full week of uh, time with in-person learning back at the school that I teach in. And uh, it just brings, to mind the importance of what schools and teachers do for um, our society. And so I just wanna say teachers, thank you. You are the, the weavers connecting the threads that make up the fabric of our community. And I mean that with all sincerity. Um, life is beginning to perk up a bit uh, for many people, including our students and families um and it's because of the work that you do very good thank you i am um, i just wanted to echo jennifer i fully support this this is fantastic i do have one technical question because y'all just expect that from me um if it's supposed to be monday through friday i think the dates are the third through the seventh i might be might be wrong but Again, doesn't reflect the substance of the of the intention. So that would be correct. Okay. Good catch. I didn't even catch it actually. So thank you. Well, I know that uh, from certainly my perspective, and the teachers that I know and the teachers that I love, uh, this is you know always. Been, been been something that's important to me and my four kids growing you know them growing up and me growing up is, is all the in, impacts that teachers have had in my life and certainly in theirs and I appreciate every, everything that you all do so thank you okay anybody else well we can well, Jonathan I'd like to say just a couple of things just okay. to to add to this, I, I got to visit, uh, I think it was about nine schools last week and just a couple of things to, to share. Um, I'm, I'm going to miss it. You know, I saw a lot of different classrooms, but I'm going to say a few things that stuck out to me when uh, the first graders at Evergreen, uh, when their teacher asked her to ask them to, sm to smile and wave, I asked them, how can I tell that you're smiling underneath that mask? And they say, you can always see it in our eyes, Mr. Bush. Um, and, and that was really true. I could see it in their eyes. And then, um, I was in Donna Becker's class last week and I learned what a fathom was. I never knew what a fathom was at six feet. I never knew that before, but her kids told me that, um, I got to visit Helen Plov out at Scott's Mills. I was warned if I ever come back, make sure I wear tennis shoes because sure enough, I end up doing two laps around the gym in my dress shoes because I was forced to play a game in PE. Um, and uh, just across the board, got to go out and see PE classes at Butte Creek and, and see kids uh, doing, laying down and they had sculpted themselves or doing a human anatomy unit. And uh, I don't know what grade they were, second or third grade that were doing a human anatomy unit and they were drawing on, them, on, on their sketches and everything. And so teachers do amazing things for our kids. And it was from, from you know, kind of textbook learning anatomy to, you can see it in my eyes when I'm smiling. 
um, our teachers do amazing things to connect with kids. So I'm uh, excited that kids are back in school and excited for teacher appreciation week in a few weeks. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, Shelly. I think this year's teacher appreciation week is going to be exceptionally thankful <laughs> after this year. Um, it's been extraordinary. You know, the fires, pandemic, ice. I mean, it's, it's, a, there's, it's just it has so much meaning uh, this year. And, and um, not that it didn't other years, but this was extra hard. And they had to put in some serious extra time and effort. And, um, you know, they showed their true master craft. That's what they do. And when you have a teacher that can show their craft at this level, um, it is appreciated beyond words. And as a parent and a, a former teacher, but as a parent of two kids at the high school, um, you know, it, it just, the teachers that my kids have and, and have had before are, are just amazing. And um, I'll be saying something during that week um, for sure to the teachers. So, um, but thank you, thank you. A million thank yous. Okay, well, thanks, Sean. We'll, we'll address the, uh, the dates before we, before it gets signed. So presume when it comes to adopting this that we will have those dates uh, fixed up. All right, anybody else? Um, yes, I had uh, the privilege of visiting several schools uh, earlier. I, I think it's been about six weeks with Janet and Scott. I know that teachers work hard. I know that they give so much. And this year, they have gone above and beyond to keep that close connection with their students. And now as they are working back into the classroom, they're doing things that they were never, never dreamed or trained for, but they became trained so they could create a very safe, nurturing environment for those students. And I can also say that although I sit in on communications with SFEA, what is curious about that, they may come in representing one organization, but they are teachers. They, they get to change their jerseys sometimes when they, who, but their voice is always about the students and about the care. And I have witnessed that and I have seen that in the school district. And it's, uh, it's a very beautiful thing to see. Um, the care and the true pride and love that they have for those students and the magic that they create in their classroom. So thank you. Thanks, Lori. Jonathan, I just wanted to mention that, you know, in, in, uh, in visiting schools uh, uh, this past week, I, you know, the high school, I was there a few days ago. Um, and, you know, there's so much you can tell about a school just within the first few minutes that you're there. And I was there during uh, arrival time. And the, just the feeling of sort of a quiet excitement was all over the high school. And I visited about 10 classrooms. And what I appreciated most was each teacher was going through sort of what, what to expect, uh, how to do certain things, and um, so, some really simple things, like how to fill out a hall pass, how to order your lunch, how to do these different types of things now that we're having to have all these safety precautions in place. And what I really appreciated was the care and gentleness that the teachers were presenting this to the students. It just felt really, really safe. Um, and it just it just really took me back to me wanting to be in the teachers' classes as well. So if you're out there watching and you're a teacher, and I 
at the high school and I walked into your classroom, just know that that's how I felt. And, um, and I really appreciate that from you. Thanks, Gail. All right. Well, next up, we have our superintendent evaluation summary. So we did go through the process last time we got together and we had uh, the um, OSBA representative, Kristen, who was valuable to help walk us through the process. <clears throat> But she, she took the um, comments that we made in sort of real time, put together the uh, comments and then put together a public statement afterwards, which is attached to board book in which we've, you've all seen. And I left it in draft form with the exception that we, you know, I think plugged in uh, you know, Scott's name, but otherwise it's, it's essentially in draft form and the, uh, the, the task for us is to go through and talk about it and see if we agree with where that's at. And ultimately it is an action item. And so the intent would be to, if we need to tweak it and then to subsequently vote on it later tonight. And this would be the official summary statement for Mr. Drew's evaluation. So I'll open that up to conversation. Uh, I will mention that there is one section that uh, we're pretty sure we do need to tweak, which is the final statement, which talks about working with Superintendent Scott Drew over the next several weeks to develop goals for the superintendent aligned with the district. Uh, in speaking with Scott, he would much prefer that we uh, modified that statement. He'd like to tackle that really starting in the summer um, as opposed to over the next few weeks. And there's a lot of reasons for that, not the least of which is we're still in the middle to a great extent of dealing with ever-changing crises from, you know, changes in guidance from the E and, and we've got the busing shortage and we've got kids coming back to the building. So there's a lot of reasons he'd really like to sit on that for a little bit. So um, I'll, anyway, I'll stop there and open it up to further discussion, feedback and comments from the rest of the board. Jonathan, are we talking about the superintendent evaluation right now or the public uh, statement? Which, which, which one? Specifically, the public statement is the one that we will have an action item on. That we're, so that's what we're talking about right now? The other one is just the data collected from our, our meeting the other night. Oh, OK. OK. Is that, is that going to go into his file? The, uh, into his professional file? The, um, the superintendent evaluation comments that she summarized for us. The record, yeah. Okay. I think it is anyway. I guess that's a good question. I maybe I don't really honestly know the answer to that. I know it's a public record, and we did the whole thing in public, so it kind of is out there in perpetuity. But but the uh, as to whether it's in his record, I guess I I'll have to follow up. I don't know the answer for sure. Okay. I don't know. I the the I just want to comment really quick on the superintendent evaluation um, that she she gave to us. Um, you know that's that's on board book. Um, you know if this, I mean if this is going into his file or or whatnot. Um, I don't know. I it says Scott a lot in here. You know he's our he's our superintendent, and I think that you know it's more professional in his professional um, file to say Mr. Drew. Um, I, you know, and that's really just a formality. Um, you know, he's not gonna be our superintendent forever, but he could move on at some point or somewhere. Um, and if he has to present this to another employee, I just don't want it to be Scott. You know, I, I don't know, it's, I, I guess I have higher standards than just calling him Scott when it comes to his professional portfolio. So I, I would like for it to say Mr. Drew, um, and that's just a small thing, but I think it's important. Yeah, I need to follow up on the whole question of 
But my understanding is the action for us is to approve, formally approve the public statement. And I believe that is the summative result of this process. But Jennifer, I don't know if you've got a different impression or anything to add to that. I don't really, I, that's my understanding. Yeah, I would agree that we're voting on the, the second document, the, the summary. Right. Okay, then why do we have the, the evaluation summary, the superintendent evaluation summary? Are we supposed to look that over? Transparency, I think, just that it was part of the process and it was never posted on board book previously. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And it's evidence for that supports what we're voting on. Oh, okay, great. Sounds I mean, that's good. just off, off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> Well, that might okay. be understanding too, Jennifer. Right? I, so you, it was a little caught off guard with the question because I didn't think that there was anything about that that went on his permanent record. But you made me kind of pause and say, "Well, I don't know. Maybe there is." But I don't. I think the answer is we're voting specifically on the public statement. The public statement is the final result of the process that goes into the record. Oh, okay, okay. I guess just having both documents, you know, presented to us, even though we're voting on one. I just read both of them, you know, made sure that they aligned with each other, but I wasn't really sure, you know, what the superintendent evaluate, where that information was going, those, that detailed information. So I wanna make sure that if it does, you know, go into his professional file with our public statement attached to it, um, you know, that it's, it's correct. <laughs> so that's, I just want to make sure that that's that's what we're you know. Yep. Can you ask her for? Can you ask OSCA? Oh, okay, that'd be great. Okay. For tonight, the only action item and the only thing we're voting on is the public statement. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, let me get to that. Anybody else with any comments, any discussion item? Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, I, um, I think it looks fine and I'm for, I'm all in favor of, cause things are so busy right now if to, you know, edit that final statement where it says, well, we will be working with superintendent Scott Drew over the next several weeks. I'm for changing that to, uh, we will be working with superintendent Scott Drew over the summer to develop goals for the superintendent yada yada that way you know they'll have you know he's he's kind of busy right now so i'm i'm i'm, I'm in favor of that yeah for what it's worth i am too i don't have any issue with yeah with making that final sentence um just talking about it over the summer would be fine i'd have been fine just changing the word weeks to months i don't know i i'm pretty flexible on it it's not binding exactly anyway but yeah yeah, agreed. You know, the only, yeah, the only comment I have, which is, you know, it, if this was standing alone, I would say it, it wasn't sufficiently robust. In other words, it's very cut and dried and, and kind of clinical, and it refers to obviously the standards that we evaluated them by. But given what I really like, though, is that it, it doesn't have any sort of subjective embellishment, one direction or the other. It's, it's, it's pretty objective. And that because we had that evaluation in a public meeting, we do have all of that background now as part of the public record that um, gives the public an understanding of why, uh, why this summary is, is what it is and, and, and the evidence behind um, these choices. So um, yeah, I think, I think I think this is a, a good balance of um, short to the point, satisfies what's needed, but we also know that we have evidence out there if people want to do um, some more you know, research or, or have a better understanding of how we came to these. So that's good, thank you. Well, what would folks think then if we took Tom's idea and changed it to over the summer uh, as the 
sort of lone change. I mean, I'm, I'm not looking for a vote here, but maybe some head nods or some head shaking if, if that would be of concern. Yeah, Jennifer. Oh, never mind. I think I think that I'm just thinking about procedure, but head my head's nodding. Yeah, Shelly, did you have some? I just yeah, I was just going to respond to your to your comment. Um, do we need to change the wording now in public, and then we vote on the new draft? take action on the new draft. So I think it would be important that we change the wording now. Yeah. And vote on the new draft. So we will be working with Superintendent Scott Drew over the summer, over the summer of 2021 to develop goals for the superintendent aligned. So really it's not that big of a change, but it's over summer of 2021. I certainly yeah. for the new fiscal year. I mean it could be and, and a change is a change. I, I mean, and I think we should respect it as such. Um, so I would agree. Sounds good. Jennifer. Going back to my thought that I never minded, um, I think that Tom should just make his idea a motion. I think, and then we should vote on it. And then that makes it really clear. Perfect. At least I think we should consider that. I don't know if that's absolutely right, but. What, what what if? So he would have to do the specific language. He'd have to make a motion with specific language. Right. Tom, you want to do that? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Um, I'm bring it up here. Um, I move that we edit the last state, the last sentence of the of the of the public evaluation statement to to state that. We will be working with Superintendent Scott Drew over the summer of 2021 to develop goals for the superintendent aligned with our district priorities and this evaluation. So well moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I'll just point out as a reminder, we're modifying the draft that we will officially still adopt in the action. Okay, good. Uh, Jonathan. Jonathan? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Janet? Yes. Tom? Aye. Lori? Yes. Shelly? Yes. Irv? Yes. Thank you, all in favor. And I want to verify that was Lori seconded. Yes, Mr. McLaughlin, thank you. You bet. Okay. So unless there's anything further on the superintendent evaluation summary, we will move on to 11C. Everybody good with moving on? Okay. Um, this one is a discussion item regarding the uh, July regular board meeting. The date uh, was originally July 12th, and I have proposed that we move it out a week. There are at least two people who will be out of town, uh, one being myself, on, on that date. And in fact, had I had any other option, I would have been willing to, to, to make some changes, but I will literally be in the air during that meeting. So uh, moving it would be ideal for me. So I'm floating that idea and seeing if there is any, well, anybody who has any real hard conflict and or if there are any objections to moving it out exactly what you Jonathan, is that the first meeting of it's the year? The first meeting after the election, if that's the question. Yeah, the first official meeting with new board members. So then the new elected board members won't be inducted until the 19th? It would be until the 19th. Is there a policy that we have or a law that they have to be inducted by a certain time? I'm not aware of any. I know that, um, you know, we normally follow precedent regarding board meeting times, but they are to be established by the chair. So that's sort of the policy as I understand it. 
the um, you know my reaching out is because I want to make sure we're not you know, creating a bigger problem than than we would otherwise have. Well, clearly I won't be here, <laughs> but I just want to make sure that we don't have a policy. I'm not I'm not aware, but I just want to make sure that we don't have a policy that states that we, you know, as a board or that as a board, you know, there needs to be, you know, induction of the new board members, you know, might want to take a look at that. So being on the policy committee, I can look that up, make yeah, sure. Right. I don't recall anything, but you're right. I mean, I, we should make sure that there's that there's not something. Yeah, let's let's confirm that first. Is this an action item? No. Okay. This is a discussion item. Oh, okay. That would be my thought process on that. So, if you want, I I can get back to you, or I can bring it back to the board and see if we have a policy with it. Yeah, no, that'd be appreciated. If, you, if there's anything that you can do, it'd be good to know. Okay. So okay. It, we're looking at July 19th for our well, that regular was board. It, it okay, be, that was part of the proposal. And then we would have our work session following the 26th. Yeah, okay, um, thank you. I was just asking to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, well, you can always email me if you realize that that date's horrible for some reason and we'll float other dates, um, but we'll, we'll get it figured out. All right, anything else before we move on? All right, 11D, the 2021-22 uh, school year calendar. So this is an action item. And so we've got it as a discussion item in case anybody has any concerns about it. That we're talk about. Um, so this is this calendar is for a normal year, five days a week, right? Okay, I'm ready to vote on that. Right, amen to that. <laughs> Regular year, let's just imagine one without you know, fire in this, that'd be great. Let's just vote yes right now. Okay. Okay. It sounds like nobody has any concerns or discussion. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, can we get walked through the process that it, this draft took to get to us? I think we can. I know, well, Scott, I'll, I'll ask you if you'd like to address it. So uh, Kevin Palmer uh, helped facilitate this and we brought together a representative group like we normally do each year. And, and um, I think the group was really thankful that we're planning a calendar for the, the next year that is quote unquote a, a normal calendar. So it was really collaborative and there are a couple of minor tweaks but nothing major. Um, you know, it actually went really smoothly. What were the tweaks? I didn't see anything. <laughs> uh, Leslie, help me out. Was it, there was an early release. Uh, I don't know if there were some adjustments, really minor adjustments there. And then uh, for inclement weather days, I think was another one. Oh, right, okay. There had been a recommendation for a fourth. If you notice there, there's a first closure, second closure, mm -hmm. third closure. There we had, took out the... We had, there had mm -hmm. been a fourth closure. We removed that one. Okay. Leslie, do we switch any dates around? Do we have to make any adjustments with early release? I can't remember off the top of my head. We ended up not. We had talked okay. about it previously, but um, we went with the committee's recommendation. Yeah. So very minor, minor tweaks. Okay. Well, I'm going to move us along then if there's no other discussion there. So we do have several policies that are up for second reading. Uh, it was pretty late at the work session when we got to them. So this is a good opportunity for us if we have questions or discussion to go through them. So I'm gonna go through them one at a time, make sure that if there's any conversation that we have an opportunity to have it here tonight. First one up uh, is the 
bias incident complaint. That's ACB AR. Uh, it was recommended for fast track for OSPA modifications that we have incorporated into our performance policy. Anybody have any questions or comments or concerns? Okay. Next up, BBAA. And this is the individual board member's authority and responsibilities. Now, this one has also pretty minor edits. Um, and it was an uh, OSBA update. They last updated theirs on February 2019. I'm not going to read the summary statement. I presume you've all been able to, to read it, but they were pretty minor in terms of the changes. No, nope. okay. BBF, this is the um, policy for standards of conduct. It also was a 2019 OSBA update um, and we've incorporated those, those items. BBFC, reporting of suspected abuse. Uh, it's a new optional policy that was recommended um, by OSPA. Okay, uh, the next two are both COVID related uh, leave modifications. One of them is being removed, and one of them is being actually, they're both being removed. Right? And, that's how it works. I'm rereading it now. Yeah, both of them say that they're being removed, and that was per um, the recommendation. Okay, and then the last. Two are uh, criminal records related uh, items here. And these are predominantly uh, just sort of district. Well, Dan, I don't know, Dan, if you have anything you want to add to these two, um, they're kind of way in the weeds about sort of hiring process and stuff. I'll just I'll just say you know there's been a lot of changes to the background checking of individuals both to 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 tighten it up it actually caught my attention just in relation to our bus driver uh, conversation that we had at the work the last work session but um, there has been a lot of uh, updating of who has to get fingerprinted uh, in order to uh, work with students so this um, this language is in alignment with that with that new legislation. Everybody good? All right. Hey, Jonathan, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, can I, can we go back quickly to BBAA, individual board members authority and responsibilities? Mm -hmm. um, so the only, the only question I have is under number one, what says request for information. Um, and it says a copy of the material may be made available to each member of the board. So if a board member requests information from uh, Steve or from Scott, from Dan, it says the copy of the material may be made available. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I just wonder whether we should check with OSBA because in the past they've said that board members should all receive the same information. And so I don't know if that's in conflict with either other policies that we have or their recommendation. If it's just their recommendation, we can certainly choose to state it however we are comfortable stating it. And I don't necessarily, I mean, I guess, you know, at risk of everyone getting multiple copies of things that they are not particularly interested in receiving, you know, that's sort of the downside. 
And May does leave it open for someone to say, you know, hey, I'd like a copy of that. Okay, great, thanks, you know, no problem. Um, I just wanna make sure that it doesn't conflict with anything that we've received explicit instruction on from, from OSBA. I don't know if we the can, policy group- We can certainly, it. we can certainly check on that, Janet, absolutely. Okay. If I had to guess, Janet, I would say that that probably that language is probably in there just to make the board member aware that you wanted a report that you know that it may go out that you asked for that report and it goes out to everybody. So just a, a more of a heads up that that request may not stay stay private. If that makes sense, right. that's, that's what my oh, sure. is. I don't think. Um, so that, that would be my best guess as to why that language is there. But I, I would agree with Scott, we can check. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense because it's not, it, yeah, that, that makes sense. I can see that interpretation of it. And, and like I said, I, I'm not necessarily uncomfortable with the language. I just wanna make sure it's consistent with what we're supposed to do, yeah. Yeah, Jonathan, I, I, it, I think it's, I think May is there, or Janet. It's just because of it's. Um, it's kind of a a, a a judgment call. So say there's an agenda item, and I have a question, but I'm asking a question that's kind of a leading question. I'd like some information. Well, that's information that I want to ask. But if everybody, if the whole board saw me ask that question, and the information came after it, that would be a discussion of of a of a that as you know we're we're discussing a um uh, an agenda item or something like that does that make sense mm -hmm. you know if i if there's if there's an agenda item and, and and i've got questions about it you know and scott gives me some information about it well it's sometimes by asking a question it, it can be interpreted as a as a discussion going on be, between the whole board if, if the if the whole board saw me ask that question and the information that came from that question. Does that make sense? Right, and I think, you know, that's why we don't do our, our reply alls, right? Um, so the, yeah, yeah but, that, that makes but, sense to, to avoid that. But essentially, sure. Right, but, but essentially, if, if we had to always give all the information from a question to mm -hmm. everybody, that's essentially reply all. Mm -hmm. Is that, I don't know, maybe I'm being a little technical, but, you know, maybe, maybe check with OSBA. Yeah, no, and, and and I only it's it's only because we've sort of been been lectured at a little bit by OSBI in this point. Of like, yeah, you should yes, do I know. I, research, I, you know, don't go do your own independent research because all the I, board members have to have exactly the same information that they're working with, and so that kind of sets up a little bit of an yes. impossible situation right there. I don't even know how that's technically possible for all of us to work with identically <laughs> the same information. So, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anything else on any of the policies? All right. Well, next up is a uh, oversight. It wasn't supposed to be on here, but I didn't catch it when we voted. So that's my bad. I didn't have any requests for a board report, so I'm not anticipating any, but uh, since it's on the agenda, if anybody has a, a report, uh, now's an opportunity. Nope. Okay. Um, well, we do have a second public comment as well. So I think what we ought to do, Maddie, is toss back up the the option, uh, well, the, the instructions for how somebody can speak. And as I said before, just to make it easier, uh, we've opened up the chat as an option. People were having issues with email, so we went ahead and opened that up as a as a means of alerting us that you're interested in speaking. And chat is open. 
Thank you. We'll wait, you know, at least a minute here in case anybody wants to make sure that, that they get their request in. All right, well, I'm not seeing any any chats firing. Um, so Debbie, unless you're getting some emails, I think we may be free to, to move on. I'm not receiving any emails. Okay. I'll close the chat. Thank you. All right, well, that moves us to our action items section and we have a few. The first of which is to approve the resolution uh, in appreciation of Teacher Appreciation Week, which is um, we, we realized was uh, off by a day in the resolution. So we will modify that before it gets signed, but it'll be May 3rd through the 7th of this year. Um, and at this point, I would accept the motion to uh, adopt said resolution with the date change. I move to approve a corrected version of the Teacher Appreciation Week resolution. I second it. And seconded. Any further discussion? All right, let's call the vote, Debbie, please. Jonathan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Janet? Yes. Tom? Aye. Lori? Yes. Shelley? Yes. Irv? Yes. Thank you. All in favor? Right, and we have our superintendent evaluation public statement, which we did make a motion earlier in the meeting to change the final sentence to indicate the summer of 2021 instead of the next weeks regarding his goals. Um, I so, make a motion. Oh, yeah. you ready for no. that? I make a motion to accept the uh, amended superintendent evaluation summary. So moved. Second it. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, we can call the vote, Debbie, please. Jonathan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Janet? Yes. Tom? Aye. Lori? Yes. Shelley? Yes. Irv? Yes. Thank you. All in favor? All right, next up, we have our school year calendar for next year. I'd like to make a motion to approve the 2021-22 school year calendar. I'll second that. I second it. Great. <laughs> Double right. second. It. Any, <laughs> any further discussion? All right. Jonathan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Janet? Yes. Tom? Aye. Lori? Yes. Shelley? Yes. And Irv? Yes. Thank you, all in favor. And the last one, which is the contract award to Pacific Office Automation for copy, copier and multifunction device management. I move to approve the contract award to Pacific Office Automation for copier MFD printers and device management. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Do we need to have the uh, contract amount in there, Jennifer? I do not know the answer to that question, Irv. The contract amount, I think, was in the, uh, the executive summary. I'm opening it up right now. 
I just think for public comment, we should have the contract amount is normal, but. Yeah, page uh, three, uh, 60 month cost for all uh, facets, copier, software printers, device management, uh, $397,534. Five year annual five year total projected savings of one hundred and eighty three thousand eight hundred ten dollars. Very good. good point. So it's been moved and seconded. In uh, actually, has it been seconded? No, I don't remember. Yes, yeah, it was. Yeah. Was it? Thank you. Uh, uh, Shelley, I believe, did. Yeah. I popped open the document and then I realized it wasn't. Here. So, okay, moved and seconded. Or that was good discussion. Any any other discussion on it regarding the uh, contract? Nope. Okay. Well, with that, let's uh, take the vote. Please. Jonathan. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Janet. Yes. Tom. Aye. Lori. Yes. Shelley. Yes. And Irv. Yes. Thank you. All in favor. Okay, well, with that, we will move to item 15, future agenda item request. An opportunity to mention things that are on your mind that you may want to have thought about for future agenda. Yeah. So, so I would like to request um, an agenda item to follow up on the public comment we had this evening regarding um, the grade changes for the teachers in the district. Um, I, I, I would just like a follow up on that as an agenda item and see how that's going. Right, thanks, I, I wrote that down. Okay. Yeah, Lori. Yeah, and I, I'll see how this works, but um, what was interesting is that we talked about the cost of the last motion. Is it, um, I know that we had a cost, I, I guess I wonder about the transparency when we approve things. And I know that there was a cost with OSBA coming and being our third party. Uh, for the evaluation, which went very well. Um, I don't know. Is that something that we should share openly? I mean, as public comment, I mean, as public record in our, I don't know. I, I'm just throwing it out there. You don't need to answer, but it was just something that crossed my mind. And I don't know. I, I'm just thinking for the sake of transparency that might be just something we mention and then just move forward with what the you know our decision was, yeah. With the evaluation, did I make sense? Yep, makes sense. One, okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to say on that one. But yeah, I was just going to say ahead. I know it's not the time to get into a discussion, but I did want right. to articulate my support of Lori's request in that I think it would be interesting to examine you know, when the board spends money on board business. Thank you. Um, that might be an appropriate um, appropriate thing to, 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 to make really transparent to, to the public. So I think it's worth worthy of a discussion. Thank you. Thank I would you. Agree with, I would agree with that as well. I'd like to piggyback on that as well for that request. All right, well, I'll throw one out too. Um, it's been brought up a couple of times with people that um, I've talked to about if the board was going to consider moving back to in-person meetings at any point with the school buildings opening back up and kids returning to the classroom. And so I think it would probably be wise if at some point in a near-term meeting, we at least talked about what that might look like and the pros and cons of uh, doing that.
Okay, anything else? All right. Well, that is going to move us into executive session. We uh, will be leaving here shortly to move into executive session specifically to discuss a sick leave day. Uh, when we do so, our Zoom webinar will remain open. Anybody who uh, you know, wishes to can wait for us to return, we will return back to open session in consideration of those requests that we're going to hear about during the executive session. So we anticipate about a 15 minute executive session. Oh. So with that, um, I'm going to officially move us into executive session. And as a reminder to the board, you need to leave your Zoom webinar and rejoin uh, the other meeting that will be sent out. And Jonathan, do you, you need have to read to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> read the the for or us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> making sure I covered everything else first. Uh, so uh, we are going to move into ex executive session under ORS 192662F to consider information on records that are exempt by law from public inspection. Specifically, this is a sick leave bank. Good. Thank you. All right, well, I do think we are back. Classic, let me know if you're not back yet, right? <laughs> um, so, okay, we are gonna move to item 18, consideration of sick leave bank requests. And at this point, uh, I will accept, uh, we'll start with the first motion here. Uh, I would like to move that we approve 40 days of sick bank leave request for Mr. Ira Jackson. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Debbie, go ahead. Jonathan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Janet? Yes. Tom? Hi. Lori? Yes. Shelly. Yes. Irv. Yes. Thank you. All in favor. Great. Thank you. I believe there's another motion coming. Oh, yes. Um, I would like to move that we approve 65 sick relief days for Miss Kathy Reynolds. So I'll second that. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, Debbie. Jonathan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Janet? Yes. Tom? Aye. Lori? Yes. Shelley? Yes. Er. Yes. Thank you, all in favor. All right, great. Uh, I move to approve a sick leave bank request for 20 days for Jennifer Boswell. So moved. I'll second it. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, Debbie? Jonathan. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Janet. Yes. Tom. Aye. Lori. Yes. Shelly. Yes. And Irv. Yes. Thank you, all in favor. All right. Well, that concludes our agenda for tonight, everybody. So uh, appreciate it and uh, meeting adjourned. Good night. Thank you.